really search out and find the meaning that they, they would like but in their life. But you know what? Only God can really change a person's life. Only God can do that kind of transformation. And so uh, we're in the business of helping people, directing people towards God and towards Jesus uh, for that transformation to take place. So um, I just encourage you to open up your heart today. We're going to welcome, uh, we're going we're gonna to roll out the welcome mat to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit today to come and just to speak into each heart and each life today. So why don't you stand up with us? We're going to sing.
beautiful story in the New Testament in Luke chapter 7 about uh, a time when Jesus went to dinner with, uh, with a, a religious leader. And it's kind of funny because Jesus often hung out with people who were fairly irreligious. You know, the Bible says that he was called a friend of sinners. <laughs> so he's my friend. He's your friend. And, uh, but this is a religious guy and and Jesus went with his disciples to this dinner I guess it was a formal dinner not quite sure but they were sitting around the table respectable ordered and uh, sitting there having a meal anyway, anyway what happens is that a woman comes in carrying a, an, a jar of very expensive ointment and uh, she just kneels down behind where Jesus is sitting and, uh, and she's crying and she's weeping over her sins because the Bible says in Luke 7 that she was an immoral woman. It says an immoral woman came in carrying this jar of expensive ointment. And she was weeping and it says that her tears were falling on Jesus' feet and she was wiping his feet with her hair. And she was... Uh, anointing his feet with this ointment, this expensive perfume on, his, on Jesus' feet. And so the leaders, the, the religious people that were there, the men were there, they, they were saying, well, doesn't Jesus know who this woman is? I mean, surely um, if he was a prophet, if Jesus was a prophet, surely he would know that this is, who the, this is a sinner. <laughs> oh, I don't think the implication was in those words, the implication is, well, she's a sinner, but I'm not. That's, I think that's what they were, they were saying, really. And it's, it's, it's funny how that we, we like to attach to people a rating system for sins, don't we? We like to say that some sins are particularly bad and, you know, and some sins are almost okay. But as for me, well, I, I'm okay. There wouldn't be anything I've done that actually would be really what you would call a bad sin. That's human nature to do that, to justify ourselves, And we do it by pointing at other people, don't we? And so that's what these men were saying. They were, they, were, they were basically pointing the finger at her and saying, well, look, she's a sinner, but I'm not. I'm okay. But at the end of this story, when you read it, it says that, you know, um, it says Jesus says to the woman, he says, your sins are forgiven and your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. What I love about that is, is it wasn't her tears and her sorrow. And the Bible uses the word repentance, to, just, to repent or to be sorry for our sin and to turn away from it. It wasn't necessarily, it wasn't her tears that saved her. It was the fact that Jesus was about, in a, shortly after this, to go to the cross and pay the penalty, the absolute penalty for the sins of the whole world. That's what saved her. That's what saves us today exactly the same way. And so we've got the opportunity today to celebrate and remember the death of Jesus on the cross. Why don't you just look to God right now with me? We thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that you died in my place. Thank you that we can remember, as, as your, your word says, we should remember your death on the cross. We should keep that in our focus and we should acknowledge that, Jesus, you died in my place. And we do that with joy and with thankfulness today. We acknowledge your death and your resurrection today. This little piece of biscuit that speaks of the broken body of Jesus and this grape juice that speaks of his shed blood. We thank you for it today, Lord, that we can remember what you did for us. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you that we can be in your presence today. And Lord, you open the way so that we can come right into the very presence of God. Amen. Amen. I just so enjoy just coming and just meeting and sharing together. It is so good to see these faces back. Some of them I haven't seen for quite a while. Some of them for the first time last week. So great. Um, I just felt the Lord say to us this morning that um, just as the rain that you've heard through the night and the rain that you've heard this morning, it's like the Lord is saying, I am bringing showers of blessing to you because you've had a dry period. Uh, you've been locked up and some of, some of you have been really struggling and it's been a hard time. I think all of us have probably struggled. And there's been hard times. He says, I'm pouring out showers of blessing to you this morning. And that, those showers of blessing will bring um, growth in your life. And he just says to you, open up your heart and receive showers of blessing because they are good things and they will help you to grow and that will be like a sprout coming up out of the ground, a green shoot, a new shoot, not uh, just the growing of something that was before, but a new shoot. Um, just receive that in Jesus' name this morning. <clears throat> I was told by my boss when I started my apprenticeship that I'm a thinker. And, and at the time I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. But I'll tell you what, at 12 o'clock at night, it's a horrible thing. <laughs> or at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, do you have, do some of you, or do you have that trouble? Oh, my brain just cannot stop sometimes. <laughs> and I know that when um, I'd come home from a, a Bible study or a men's group, I knew that it was really good because I knew that I could not sleep. I knew that was, that was telling me that I had a really good night. <laughs> Anyway, what that does is cause me to, I often reflect, I reflect over my life, and I guess all of us do, we reflect back on things from time to time, often we're too busy to, but occasionally when we've got a little bit of time, we reflect on, our, on things, and we look at things in our life, and there's regrets, and I certainly have some. Um... I actually, I have a broken relationship with my best friend from school. And uh, I didn't realise how broken it was until a friend of mine was going to work out on his farm. And I said, oh, that's Ross. Go out and say g'day to Ross for me. And he said, oh, Ross, look, Neil says to say g'day. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, he went to the same school as me. That was really hurtful. And I didn't realise how broken our relationship was until I'd heard that. We were best, best mates for years after school. In fact, we both had girlfriends in Brisbane and we would kick around together. Her best friend and my best friend, we were girlfriend and boyfriend. And um, anyway, what it's made me realise is we go through life and there's things we've got wrong. And I know I played probably a significant part in that. I was what we call young and stupid. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, I, I've asked God if he can actually try to repair that for me, but I'm not sure whether that's workable the other end or not. But um, I'm willing to apologise for my part. Anyway, where am I going with this? We, we look at our lives and <sighs> there's things we have regrets, things we could have done better and things that maybe we just downright out, out wrong, outright wrong. And um, it causes a guilt in our life and that guilt is something we come to own and it actually has an effect on what, how we see ourselves and how we see our lives, how we, how we work, how we... Um, mix and socialise with other people because we have this view of ourselves and that somehow we're broken. And, you know, it's pretty hard to, to live in this world, especially by the time you get to adulthood, and not have dirty hands like these. <laughs> I would say probably none of us can say we don't have dirty hands. And... We carry that and we can carry the guilt and the shame of what we've done 
the cause of our dirty hands, or sometimes much worse. I can also I would also want to just open this to sometimes we share a, we own a guilt that's not really ours. It's been placed on us because of someone who had some kind of element of control or, or in some situation they pour this thing on us and we come to own this guilt or shame that's not really ours. But it, it, it's somehow attached to us and it affects our lives as well. It affects our view of ourselves. It affects not only our view of ourselves, but because of that it affects our relationship with other people and, and how we conduct ourselves. It can cause us to, to be a failure or it can cause us to overachieve, to compensate. Neither of those things are good for us and neither of those things are the real us because we've come to own something that we shouldn't and don't deserve to own. So there's two cases here. And I'm, I'm sure we probably have both in our lives. You know, the Apostle Peter, um, before we knew him as an apostle, was out fishing one day. Um, he was a professional fisherman with the cast nets and casting the nets out the side of the boat all night. And uh, they had caught nothing. Anyway, they were near the shore and uh, Jesus is standing on the shore and he calls out to Peter and he says, cast your net on the other side. Cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now, Peter's a professional fisherman. He knows how to fish, but he'd caught nothing. What's he got to lose? So he, he throws the net over the other side of the fish, over the other side of the boat, I'm sorry. And... And what happens is they get such a huge catch of fish that the nets are breaking and they're so big they're trying to pull these nets in. All men on board are trying to pull this, these nets in. And Peter realises this is a holy man that's standing on the beach. And they come to shore because they've got to drag these nets in. They actually couldn't get them on the boat and they drag the nets up on shore and Peter's standing there and Jesus is standing there and Peter says to him, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. You see how it even affected a man who was to become one of the great apostles. Peter knew that this was a man who seemed to be righteous and pure and Jesus, Peter just saw in himself his dirty hands, his brokenness, his guilt and his shame. And, that's a, and what he'd said to Jesus was a direct result of how he saw himself. You know, we have this term, you know, look me in the eye when, when you want to say that. And it comes from the, from the expression of someone who's guilt when they don't want to look you in the eye and they're looking down when they've done something wrong. It's, it's a term we have these days. You look me in the eye and say that. Because of our guilt, it just somehow causes that shame and we just can't look someone in the eye when we know we've, we've done them wrong. So it affects our decisions, it affects our attitudes and it actually affects our relationships. Without realising it becomes this short leash on our neck and it, and it stops us from going the places well, we should be free to go. It's a leash that stops us going into, into, into places of joy and freedom and, and satisfaction and, and relationship and all these things, but this leash can actually hold us back. Or it can be like um, being captive in a cave and you're looking out and you can see the light. You can see the light. But for some reason you just can't go out there. Because of the shame, you don't feel that you're worthy or, because, or you, that you have any right to walk out into that light. And we sing a song sometimes about that. You know, I ran out of that cave. The person who wrote that must have known exactly what this feeling was like to be set free from that cave. Another thing it causes us is to have a broken or even no relationship with God. Because just like Peter, don't dare enter a church building because if God's there, I can't, I can't stand before him. 
and I stay away. And it has an eternal, it's an eternal decision that person is making based on some brokenness, based on some on shame or guilt, which is not the right place to be making a decision. And it causes us to have an eternal, making an eternal decision in our lives to not know God. Maybe you've been keeping a distance from him too just because of that. I've got friends that I once invited to church and they said, oh, you know, the roof would fall in. Now, we've got pretty strong roofs in churches, but they... Clearly there's a thinking in their mind, in their, in their head, that somehow I'm not worthy or my, my hands will be exposed and I don't want to be exposed. I want to say, no. Jesus says this to you today. Jesus says this to you today. Once you're alienated from God... And you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now Jesus has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Jesus says this to you. I want you to come home. I want you to come home. I don't want you to feel shame. I don't want you to feel guilt. And I especially don't want us to stop us being together. You know, the, de the devil has this, he portrays the church as this something where, where God just wants you to feel guilty all the time. It's somehow a controlling thing to c keep you in order. That's not God. That's the devil. You see, the devil loves religion. Religion is his, is his, is his building, and, it, and it's a controlling thing. But Jesus says, I come to set you free, and you will be free indeed. See, Jesus took our guilt, and he took it to the cross. And with that guilt, he took shame. He took it to the cross and he came to own it. He said, whatever guilt there is in this world, I'll own it. I am guilty. I am guilty for everyone. I will take their shame and I will take it to the cross. So Jesus says to you today, let me take your guilt away. And you can stand before me and the Father with no shame. In Hebrews 10 verse 22 it says this, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. And that's what we can come to when we come to Jesus it's like we can have, we can be washed clean. We, so, we sing songs about this. Matthew wrote this beautiful song today about being washed clean and have our, having Jesus took all that for us and we can stand before the throne of God, righteous, pure as white snow. You know, and just as, as we're talking about Jesus washes us clean. and puts me in a place before God where no longer I need to feel that shame. No longer I need to carry that guilt because he carried it for me and he washes me clean. And I can stand before him with clean hands. He took it, and it's gone forever. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
There's a place, Jesus says, for you in my kingdom. Don't let shame or guilt hold you back any longer. I accept you and I call you to me now. Give that guilt and shame to me and let me be God to you. I guess there's one thing I just want to add to this. Jesus is willing, and not only willing, desires and has already done this for you, whether you accept it or not. And so the, the very decision is actually yours. It's not for him to decide. He's decided. He's done it. He's paid the penalty. He's carried that for you. But it's up to you to give it to him. It's up to you to do that. To acknowledge, first of all, that you have had dirty hands. To acknowledge, first of all, that maybe those dirty hands aren't necessarily your fault, but I'm sure there is. But there's other stuff too that's been laid on you that you don't deserve to own and you don't need to own anymore. And he says, I will carry that for you. Let me be your God. Let me be God to you. I just asked the musicians that will come up. We're going to sing that song again. And I'm going to open up this area because I believe today there are some people who need to know, who want to release themselves, who want to get that off themselves forever. <clears throat> because the burden is too heavy. And the cost is too high. Just as before we sing... I'm going to go break away from a little bit of what I was going to do here, but I'd ask you to bow your heads and pray this prayer with me, especially if you have not been here before in this place of time where I'm talking about giving this to Jesus. Just bow your heads and pray this with me. Father in heaven, I know that I've done wrong and I know that I'm not worthy of your presence or your kingdom. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me once and for all, for all my sins and failures, and take my guilt and shame away before you. I ask you, Lord, to lead me in all that I do from now on. From now on, I trust in you. If you've prayed that prayer this morning, as we sing this this next song, I ask you to come out, because we'd like to... Well, first of all, it's a great thing to share a great thing that's happened in your life. We'd like to come and, and, and just pray with you this morning personally. And I'm sure God actually has a word for you directly. So um, if you come out, God will give a word, a word of knowledge to you, that he will speak to you into your heart. Let's stand and sing this song. Sleep. 